John's. Miami's going to win, beat Miami, beat St. John's and Miami, two of the top ten teams in America, and we will put Rutgers in a tournament. <laughs> You gonna play point guard for him? How are they gonna get all that done? Handle the rock, you baby. You can handle the rock, all and right. Bigger can shoot the rock. That's all right. right. We got that all a writer, down. baby. Honorary alum degree. You all right. Well, we go back in time. I think Providence tonight is gonna struggle with Georgetown. Georgetown is due to beat somebody. They played very well against St. John's. They had the big win at Rutgers, which really hit Rutgers after Rutgers had that two-point loss to Seton Hall. They lose at home to Georgetown. Georgetown's due to beat somebody. They lost by two this weekend to Providence, and I really think Providence tonight's going to have their hands full with Georgetown. Well, you know, Georgetown next year, I think, is going to be dynamite, bringing in a lot of big-time recruits, a lot of size to go along with their young guards, Braswell and Perry. When you talk about Rutgers, they should win tonight, and then they got the matchup with St. John's. John's. They'll have to beat St. John's and maybe beat Miami to even have an outside shot to get back on a bubble. They let it slip big time, losing four games in a row. All right, well, let's set the table for what's coming up tonight, both on ES. The one game remaining bigger is Rutgers and Pittsburgh. You say Rutgers needs a couple of wins, but even if they get by the Panthers, who are using six or seven players tonight because of eligibility and injury issues and lame duck Ralph Willard, even if they win that game, St. John's looms. Well, Rutgers really hurt themselves when they, you know, they lose four straight, but two of those four, when they lost to Seton Hall by two in the Meadowlands, and then the next thing you know, they lose at home to Georgetown, even though they lost at Miami last weekend. Those four, but the two in the middle really hurt them. I mean, to beat St. John's, it's got to be a major coup. They played close games uh, if they beat Pittsburgh tonight, but I think Rutgers has got to make a run in order to get to the NCAA tournament. I'll tell you, Digger, you talk about Pittsburgh and Ralph Willard. I really felt that Ralph Willard would be a star. For an NCAA bid, Rutgers beat Pittsburgh last night 64-51 to in the first round of the Big East Tournament in Madison Square Garden. The win was number 18 for Rutgers this season. Tonight, the Scarlet Knights take on St. John's. A breezy, chilly day tonight at the Garden. They are 18 and 11 at this point. Do they need a win tonight to make the big dance? Yeah, I think Rutgers does. They do need that win because I think one of the things that they've had the problem with, they've had a very good year. Kevin Bannon has really brought back Rutgers into the Big East and really has done a nice job with them. But the losses that they had at the end of the year, the four in a row to Georgetown, uh, and Seton Hall. Those are two teams that you have to win, right. especially if you want to get into the NCAA at that particular time of the season. Is there a more difficult team to figure out than Syracuse? They say they beat St. John's. Do you think they have a shot to, uh, to make it into the tournament, or are they still an NIT team? All right, thanks, Brian. If they win, are, are they in? I, th I think that's going to be, you know, the, the word bubble has to pop up here somewhere, and I think that really is one of the most difficult decisions that the selection committee will have if they win tonight because they've had a great season. Those four losses will, will mount up, but two of those were against Miami and St. John's. So I don't think the selection committee will hold that against them. Some other co conferences like the ACC, maybe three, possibly four, that may open up a door for another team like Rutgers. All right, Jim, stick around. You'll be back a little bit later on to great. discuss the national picture. Coming up next, three quarters of our bracket sheet filled out. Michelle Tafoya will give us the pairings in the West as you take a live look at the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers, who still await news of their fate. Will their bubble burst or will they play in the West? We'll find out when we go back live to Kansas City right after this. Coming up in the half hour, but we are going to start with a field of 64. The brackets are out. So get ready to fill them out. Not too many surprises. Now, Rutgers didn't get in. Do you agree with most of what the committee did? Yeah, unfortunately for Rutgers, I do agree with that because I think, you know, at the end of the season, they lost four games. They lost to Miami, um, which they would not hold against them. But Seton Hall and Georgetown were two tough losses for Kevin Bannon. He did a great job this season with them. It's unfortunate for them because they had a senior-laden team with Jeff Billett and Rod Hodgson, and it was difficult for them to get the loss. All right, we're going to go through all the brackets, and we're going to start where uh, the watched as the brackets unfolded and obviously some very long faces only to see that they were left on the outside looking in. When you get as close as we, I'm sure we were, uh, and haven't been to, to the dance before, uh, I'm just, just sorry for the kids, particularly our seniors, uh, that they're not you know, going to have that opportunity to experience something special. Obviously, we're a little disappointed now, but uh, you know, we have something to look forward to still. We, uh, you know, we had a we had a great season. We won 18 games, and you know, we've been playing the NIT tournament. And uh, you know, looking looking at some of the teams that didn't make it, uh, the NIT tournament is going to be we're going to have some pretty good games there. Rutgers in the NIT, so is Seton Hall. Give us your I know it's early. Give us your final. NIT. Stay on the bubble. The Scarlet Knights prayed all night for their name to be called. It never happened. The disappointed team settles for the NIT. 
know, obviously, the, you know, the goal was to get to the NCAA, and that's every team's goal. But, uh, you know, we're still happy. We're proud of what we did this year. Just sorry for the kids, particularly our seniors, uh, that they're not, you know, going to have that opportunity to experience something special. Rutgers will host Hofstra on Wednesday in a first-round NIT game. Seton Hall and Princeton also earned NIT bids. In the women's tournament, Rutgers is the number now. Today, Rutgers, they were certainly disappointed. Our cameras were on the campus today when they were uh, anxiously sitting there waiting, and finally Kevin Bannon got up. He realized his team was not getting in. There was great disappointment there. Let's uh, hear some reaction from Rutgers. We didn't help ourselves, you know. We, we could have got more done in the last couple of weeks, and that's the way it goes. And, uh, and you know, you learn, it's, there's some life lessons here as well, and certainly some things that I hope that, that the young kids in our program remember all this stuff, this experience, what we've gone through. And, uh, you know, we, we play ourselves into a position where we're not like this in the future. All right, again, Rutgers is heading for the, uh, the NIT bill. Your opinions and comments, we'd like to hear them. Give us a call. Yeah, we'll show you some folks who are ready for March Madness. That story next in sports. March Just Madness, and everybody's uh, got their sheets <laughs> floating around. College basketball, several New Jersey teams are in the middle of March Madness as the NCAAs and the NIT both get underway this week. Rutgers is a site for both, and fans turned out today in full force. This was a scene all day at Rutgers. Fans waiting in line for hours to get tournament tickets. March Madness at its best. After all, Rutgers has two teams in postseason tournament play. The men will host Hofstra Wednesday in the first round of the National Invitational Tournament, and the women will host Dartmouth on Friday in the first round of the NCAA. It's wonderful. How long have you been here? Three hours. <laughs> now, you've got choices. I think he needs it. Oh, no. You've got choices. You can do women or men or, or both. Uh, really? Both. Yeah. So you're here to get the uh, Try to, tickets yes. And yes. NCAA tickets. Right, yes. Right? Have you been following the team all season? All season. Yeah. Very. They don't have a thing to be ashamed of with the records that they have, and especially the coach that the ladies have. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. top. She's done a great job. Top job, and the short times he's been there, did a wonderful job. I think they're going all the way to San Jose this year. The women. Definitely. And the men are going to the garden. <laughs> that fan support will help ease the sting a bit for the men who had high hopes of an NCAA bid. I, I think we've gone from an evening where everyone was disappointed about not going to the NCAs, and you wake up in the morning and there's a line around your gym, and uh, there's a lot of excitement about the women's team hosting the NCAA, us hosting the NIT, and just a lot of good people that pick your spirits up and that are very, very supportive. Our goal was to be a postseason team and to have a winning record. That hasn't even happened here since 91-92, so the kids did a great job this year. It's a young team. It's a great group of guys, and so the NCAA thing wears off and you celebrate, you know, being an NIT team and having a great year, which these guys certainly have. And this is what the NIT lineup looks like for the New Jersey teams anyway. On Wednesday, it's Rutgers and Hofstra, as we said. Meanwhile, Seton Hall travels to Norfolk to take on Old Dominion, and Princeton will host Georgetown. In women's NCAA play, Rutgers will host Dartmouth, uh, Rutgers number three seed on Friday at 8, and St. Peter's of Jersey City will travel to Blacksburg, Virginia, to take on Virginia Tech. That's on Saturday at 6.30. So things heat up, start heating up here on Wednesday. And the NIT, you said, begins Wednesday. Wednesday, and the NCAA is Thursday. So All right, Jerry. Big fun for we are relying on <laughs> the tournament. Concern. It was obviously a disappointing Sunday. They were on the bubble, hoping to get into the big dance, but things did not work out. Perhaps because down the stretch, they stumbled, losing five of the last six. They did finish with a record of 18 and 12. It was still a very disappointing situation, and the news came hard to the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers last night. Well, obviously, we're you know we're very disappointed. Uh, you know, when you when you get as close as we, I'm sure we were, uh, and haven't been to to the dance before. Uh, I'm just just sorry for the kids, particularly our seniors, uh, that they're not you know going to have that opportunity to experience something special. But I think you know our whole get together today, our frame of mind was that we were celebrating a great year, and. Um, significant progress with the rebuilding of our basketball program 
you know, there was about maybe eight, nine teams that were in the same uh, predicament as us. And so when you see, you know, those guys getting in, then, you know, you kind of start to realize that, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, so, you know, those, yeah, those teams got in and, you know, seeing that, you know, we kind of had an idea that, you know, we might not be there. Well, you know, it had been great to play in the NCAA tournament, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, we didn't make it. And now we have to really focus on doing the best that we can in the NIT tournament. I mean, you know, not everybody gets into the NIT tournament. So we're going to have to look at it from that standpoint and, you know, do the best we can do in, in this tournament and try to win it. Rutgers opens up on Wednesday at the rack against the Flying Dutchman of Hofstra. Seton Hall also in the tournament. Madness and sadness. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bruce Beck. Welcome to the Kevin Bannon Show. The NCAA's second season is upon us. 64 teams invited to the big dance. The Scarlet Knights of Rutgers are not one of them. Rutgers, instead, will head to the NIT, their first postseason appearance since the 91-92 season. And, Kevin, it's been a tough 48 hours for you. Well, more so for the kids, you know, they get excited. There's so much hoopla surrounding the NCAA tournament. And to be ever so close and not make it, I just feel for those guys, particularly our seniors. Are you disappointed because you really were right in the thick of things in February? It looked like you were headed to the tournament, and then all of a sudden things didn't turn out that way? Yeah, I think, you know, we picked a bad time to go into a little bit of a slump. It happens, you know. Things had gone so well for us, and I, you know, we just didn't hit on all cylinders at a very important time of the season. And we really have ourselves to blame, even though I still feel that we were a tournament team. There's a lot of tournament teams that aren't in the tournament. You can only pick so many. So I'd rather reflect on it, look at ourselves, see where we could have done better, and take care of business in the future. Rutgers was clearly a bubble team, and I think that's one of the reasons there were so many cameras following you yesterday at the selection show. Well, when it comes down to those last few teams, I think anything can happen. And, you know, you can sit there and pull out a bunch of teams right now and make a case for us versus those teams, just like some other people could, but, you know, that's the way it goes. And you sat around and waited, and it was almost like an uneasy feeling because you're almost hoping that a rabbit pops out. Yeah, I mean, that's, but I, you know, we were asked if we wanted to do that. And I felt it was a good experience for our guys. Whether we got in or whether we didn't get in, I think it's a good experience for our kids to sit there and experience that type of thing. And it's only going to help us in the future. And the fact that this team hasn't been to a tournament in so many seasons, and at least you're going to one, that has to bode well for the program. Well, it's important now that we get off the NCAA tournament thing and ref reflect on what these kids accomplished this year. 18 wins you know, hasn't happened in a long time in this program. The postseason hasn't happened in eight or nine years. Kids did a great job. We have a young program. There's a lot to be excited about, and that's where we're going to reflect, and that's where we're going to concentrate on these next few weeks. Well, how did the players feel about yesterday's disappointment? We caught up with a couple of them after the selection show. You know, there, there was about maybe eight, nine teams that were in the same uh, predicament as us, and so when you see, you know, those guys getting in, then, you know, you kind of start to realize that, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, so, you know, those, yeah, those teams got in, and, you know, seeing that, you know, we kind of had an idea that, you know, we might not be there. Well, you know, it had been great to play in the NCAA tournament, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, we didn't make it, and now we have to really focus on doing the best that we can in the NIT tournament. I mean, you know, not everybody gets into the NIT tournament, so we're going to have to look at it from that standpoint, and, you know, do the best we can do in, in this tournament and try to win it. All right, we've talked a little bit about what happened as far as the NCAA picture is concerned. We'll preview the NIT later. But, Kevin, first let's go back to the Big East tournament. I thought there was some great basketball at the Garden. Yeah, it was a great tournament. We knew it would be an exciting Big East tournament. The caliber of the league is so strong this year. And uh, I love the fact that our kids were able to come in and get this win against Pittsburgh after being going through some tough times. Rob Hodson, 11 points in the ball game. And you got contributions from a lot of people, including Joel Salvi, who's really emerged as a guy who can do things. Oh, definitely. I mean, without Rashad Kent, we needed some good minutes from Alvita. 
Lucas and Joel, and Joel did a terrific job at both ends of the court. Jeff Greer stops, pops. I really think when he's hitting, you guys are clicking. Well, he might be our best all-around player. He can put it on the floor, hits threes, gets to the rim. You know, does a lot of things to help you win a game. Jeff Billett, 11 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists. Rob Hodgson with a double-double this ball game, Coach. Well, it was good to see Rob get a little bit of confidence back. Uh, we thought that his matchup was one that we had to exploit to win this game, and he did a terrific job. You know, first game of the tournament, everyone's wondering what can happen. You think maybe you can win two or three games, but at the same time, you got to be leery of going right down. Oh, you just have to, you have to get that first one under your belt. And I, it was kind of a, an ugly game because Pittsburgh's playing some strange lineups, which forces us to play some different lineups. But I think our kids did a real good job of, of keeping them from, you know, staying away from making major runs at it. And you had a nice little run early in the second half. Well, that was the key, I think. You know, they spent the rest of the night trying to chase us uh, after we made that nice run. Great hustle by Salvi in this play. Yeah, this is typical Joel Salvi. I mean, the kid does an unbelievable job, you know, and he has that enthusiasm. You can't help but get excited. And here's a look at the offensive boards. You were aggressive. Yeah, we got back to doing some of the things that help us win, mainly getting involved on the glass and getting some defensive stops against a pretty explosive offensive team in Pitt. Good numbers for Alvitas today. So 11.7 boards, 23 minutes. Yeah, he did a nice job for us. He played with confidence. He, he, did a, he did a very good job. We had a little bit of a mismatch there, and we needed those kinds of minutes from Alvitas. You really held Vontigo Cummings in check. He made only three for 18. Yeah, we, we did a good job with our perimeter defense. We knew that they were very strong in the perimeter, and Vontigo's a great talent, but the uh, kids did a good job defensively. The man with the bandage, Dante Jones with the bucket. Dante played well. Had a very good Big East tournament. It was good to see him bounce back. He was struggling a little bit, as freshmen often do at this time of year. Rutgers goes on to win this ball game, 64 to 51. There's Tanise, and what a difference when he's really contributing. You need it. Rashad Kent, you know, out with an injury. We needed Alvitas to step up. Rutgers held Pittsburgh to 29% field goal shooting. Also, Rob Hodson, as I mentioned, 11 and 11, and a couple of assists. Yeah, Rob played a good floor game, and as I said, had his confidence back. And Joel Salvi. 9.6 rebounds in 22 energized minutes. Yeah, well, that's that's Joel Salvi for you. That's the kind of things that he does. He gets a lot done in a short period of time. Here's some post-game reaction. Oh, the bench was great. I think Alvarez and he stepped in and played a wonderful game for us. In the five position, Joel Salvi came in and does what he do best. It gave us life, offense rebounding, he scored, took some charges, things like that. And I came in off the bench and I just try to, you know, have a nice floor game, direct people in the right spots, and keep everything all together. Well, Rashad being out, it was a, it was a big damper in, in the game, you know. But we we just we just wanted to come out and do everything, you know, we could 100%. You know, when you lose four in a row at the end of a year, it's tough. And come to the garden and play, you know, very talented Pittsburgh team. Um, you know, come out with a win, it, it's great. We needed it. Uh, guys are confident, got our confidence back. And locker room's happy for a change. You know, after the last four games, it's, it hasn't been too much fun. And so now it's just, just a great atmosphere. And uh, it's, we look forward to tomorrow night. So no Kent, but plenty of supermen off the bench. Definitely. That's the key. You get it this time of year. You're going to have your injuries. You're going to have your problems. Can other kids rise to the occasion? They did in that game, and we got a well-needed victory over Pitt. And you heard Jeff Phillips say tomorrow night. Well, tomorrow night was the Red Storm of St. John's. We'll take a look at the highlights of that ball game when we come back on the Kevin Bannon Show in a moment. All the way, he thought about a dunk as he saw Postel bearing down on him, and that's what you got to think. When you get a chance a Big East game, the St. John's Red Storm in the garden, Kevin. Tough opponent, you know, that's, that's what you get. But it was an exciting night. Uh, they're a hot team. I thought our guys really played good basketball most of the night, but it wasn't enough to get it done. A little pressure because you really had to win this ball game to get into the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think, you know, we played ourselves into that position. Our guys knew that this was going to be a game where we could really put ourselves in great shape for the NCAAs. But also, we want to move on in the Big East tournament. You want to make runs in the tournament much like last year to show how far you've come as a program. All right, highlights of the ball game between Rutgers and St. John's. And I thought you had a terrific first half. Uh, I think the kids came out with the right mentality without Rashad Kent. We knew we were just going to have to let it all hang out against this very, very strong Red Storm team. And when you talk about energy, Salvi provided it. I think the rest of the team feed it off it. Yeah, we did a great job at both ends. You know, we, we were very active defensively. We were giving them a lot of problems with a little bit of a matchup zone. And I thought our kids really had their legs and were sharp all night. And there you go to the offensive glass. Good work by Greer. He had 11 points. But Dante 
Stay Jones. I mean, I think he stamped himself here as a big-time player. Yeah, I think he's, you know, one of the uh, best young players in the league, and he showed it in prime time, in the Garden, national TV. Great opportunity for Dante to show his stuff, and he was really super. Not only did he have 18 points, but he actually took the ball away from Artest here and started the break. Yeah, I mean, he plays at both ends. That's what's great about Dante and Jeff Greer, for that matter. They're kids that can really make plays at both ends of the court. Ooh! A nice slam. Well, St. John seemed to have answers throughout this game. Eric Barkley, 21 points and 7 assists. Got to give them credit. You know, we were playing at a high level, and they had very good composure. They just kept playing, and, and they made their run. Dante Jones opening up the second half as Rutgers stays in this game, and you look very much in it, and I didn't think you were nervous. No, I, th I love the way we started the second half. I mean, I was worried about that. We played at a high level in the first half, and then here we came out, and we even took it up another notch in the second half. Jones buries the three, Rutgers ahead 43-40. Now here's the key factor, Rob Hodson called for the charge, his fourth foul, 15-25 to go. Yeah, that killed us. I mean, it's just not a good decision by Rob. We had people open, you know, just uh, unlike Rob, you know, just not a real good decision. Alvinas Tanis again contributed, and you needed him to do so. Yeah, without Rashad, we needed minutes from Joel Salvi and, and V, and they both did a very, very good job for us. But then the run came. It was a 12-0 run by the Red Storm. Well, that's it. You know, that's why they're the team that they are. They, they made a couple of threes, and they had a 12-0 a run, which we never really recovered from. We made a little mini run, but it wasn't enough and you know they have so many weapons that we kept them in check for a while but it just wasn't enough. Rutgers did cut it to eight with 544 to go on this Jeff Greer three but it wasn't enough. The Red Storm running at 77 to 62. St. John shooting 58 percent from the field. Dante Jones a game to remember in the garden. Definitely it should help Dante's confidence tremendously in that in that venue to uh, have that kind of performance. Uh, he's a young kid, but he's got a tremendous upside. Jeff Greer showing his versatility. Yeah, another solid floor game for Jeff Greer. He's playing great basketball right now. Jeff Billet, 11 points, three assists, shooting 50% from the field. Yeah, typical Jeff Billet effort. Uh, real solid play. Uh, reduced his turnovers, took care of the ball, ran his team, did a great job. Some thoughts from Rutgers on playing St. John's in their own building. Yeah, they're, they're just real tough, I mean, on the boards, and they're real relentless down low, and it just seemed like when they made their run, we got some good shots, and uh, the, the shots have been falling for us just to just stop dropping, and, you know, and then we, we had trouble containing them on defense, and so, you know, next thing you know, we're down 10, and it's tough to, it's tough to come back on that team because, you know, you, you try to get stops, but then they get an offensive rebound, and get a put back, and it just kind of takes uh, takes your heart out. And it's tough because they make a couple of plays, and they got the whole crowd behind them, and the crowd you, you get a lift off the crowd. I mean, the same thing happens to us when we play at the rack. So it's kind of tough because they, they get some energy from the crowd. And, and we didn't have that today. So, I mean, that's that, that's what made the difference. Oh, it's, it's always tough playing a, you know, a top 10 team. You know, they have, you know, great intensity. And um, I think we, we, we came out and we played with our hearts. And we just, uh, it just the ball bounced the wrong way for us tonight. Kevin, you did play with your hearts. You guys played with great energy. And you had a solid ball game. You can't be disappointed with a loss in that situation. No, I think our guys, you know, really brought something to the table. Uh, with Rashad Ken, I'm sure we would have had a stronger effort. And you just have to take your hat off to St. John's. They're a terrific team. They made their run when they had to, and they just didn't let us get back in the game. So this loss basically kept the Scarlet Knights out of the NCAA tournament, although you could point to other games earlier in the year but a lot of teams ended up on the bubble, and a lot of big-time programs didn't make the tournament. Well, Kevin? it's a very strong NIT this year because of that fact, but a lot of people with very strong power ratings and, and a lot of wins and a lot of success did not get in, and, you know, we're in good company. I remember listening to you in your post-game show at West Virginia. I never heard you so unhappy the entire season. You look back at a game like that or another ball game, you know, it, it just adds up as the season goes on. You steal one somewhere along the line, it might have been a different story. Yeah, but I think this is the time of year for us to reflect on what these kids accomplished, not what they didn't accomplish. And, you know, 18 wins haven't happened around this program for a long time. Postseason hasn't happened for a long time. This is a young team that, in my opinion, overachieved most of the year. And it's time to applaud that and, and not, you know, have your thoughts preoccupied by NCAA selections. All right, I get the message. No more NCAA talk. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about the NIT and Rutgers' first round opponent, the Flying Dutchman of Hofstra. Stay with us. Kevin Bannon show. So now the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers head to the NIT and their opening round opponent. 
The Hofstra Flying Dutchman, 22 and 9, America East Conference, first ever NIT bid. And that ball game will be Wednesday at the rack at 7.30 p.m. Let's talk a little Hofstra basketball. Kevin, they had two huge wins in the ECAC Holiday Festival, the first one against Georgia Tech. That's, that's just an incredible accomplishment, you know, for a, a team at that level to win the Holiday Festival is incredible. And it says all about, you know, what their program's about. Jay Wright's a terrific coach, and they have great balance. You know, it starts with point guard play. Speedy Claxton's a terrific player, and they just have enough of, it, of everything you need to have a super team. And their victory over Penn in the championship game, a game to remember Timmy Beckett hitting the three, Roberto Gittens with a pretty move here on the inside, and the Flying Dutchman really had a good year. They lost in their conference semis to Drexel, but Kevin, this team plays pretty good defense too, they don't play, they? They play at both ends. They play very, very good defense. Um, they, they execute their offense in a terrific fashion. And, you know, for a, a team at that level, they get a nice balance of inside, outside, three-point shooting, transition. I mean, they're they're very well coached. They have a very good team personality. I really like watching their team. I just happened to watch them a couple of times on TV over the course of the season and always came away very, very impressed. And balanced scoring. Norman Richardson, 14.1 points per game. Roberto Gittens, 10.3. Speedy Claxton, 13.3. Dwayne Posey, 8.6. Jason Hernandez, 9.7. Now let's take a look at the Rutgers bracket, this portion of the NIT, and it's possible down the road you may see Seton Hall again. Well, I hope we're both fortunate enough to get two wins and see each other in the third round there. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good teams here. You look at Xavier out there, you, you know, all the way down the line. I mean, if, if we're fortunate enough to find a way to win, you, you got a Georgia or a Clemson waiting for you. This is a very strong NIT, and obviously there's some fun matchups Georgetown-Princeton. Georgetown-Princeton, Providence-NC State, who played earlier in the year at Providence, and Providence won, so it is a, it's a very well put together NIT. Some good teams and some very interesting matchups. All right, let's talk about your keys for your first ball game against the Flying Dutchman, a team that's going to come into the rack and want to knock off the Big East. Well, first of all, I think our perimeter defense is definitely going to have to be good because it, it starts with Speedy Claxton. He's one of the most just prolific point guards you're going to see around. He's in the Big East. He's, he's not just a Big East player. He's a good Big East player. So perimeter defense, defensive rebounding, we've got to keep them off the offensive glass. They're a tenacious team. They get good rebounding from their wing players. And then uh, lastly, we have to execute against their what, who I consider a very good man-to-man -man defensive team. Uh, who won't be intimidated one bit. They have tough kids, a lot of kids from the metropolitan area, and they're going to come out pretty darn fired up to play against a Big East opponent. And they're 14th in the nation in defense, and any team, I don't care what conference, that holds opponents to 41% field goal percentage shooting, that's doing a good job. Yeah, they do a great job, and uh, they, their bench is deep, and like I said, they're, there's just a team chemistry personality about them. You're not surprised that they have 22 wins and they're making their first NIT appearance because they were like destined to do that, I think, uh, all year long when you watched them. They look like a championship team. And I know you want to summon the fans to come out to the rack to support this ball game. Rutgers hoping to get a good crowd because this first round of the NIT is something that you can use as a springboard for the rest of the tournament. Here's a look at ticket information for the first round game, and we'll return with a look back at the entire Big East tournament in a moment. For our Hoop of the Week, there were a number of candidates for this week's show, but the winner turns out to be a guy who's won it before. And the Hoop of the Week is brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. And Kevin Bannon, Jeff Greer gets top honors. Well, this is a nice play in transition. Dante does a great job defensively, leads him perfectly, gets him on the run, and you see Jeff Greer's athleticism and skill right there. Puts it on the dribble, gets up, and flushes it. Watch the slam and the power of Jeff Greer. I wonder if he gets a vanilla cream or a glaze for this beautiful move. <laughs> well, that's, you know, he's so athletic, but you're not going to be able to use your athleticism unless you have skill. And he's a talented guard, one of the best young guards in the Big East. And that's the Dunkin' Donuts Hoop of the Week. And now it's time to look back at the Big East Conference Tournament 20th. And MSG was about the 16th or 17th. It's brought to you by New Jersey Transit. 
First round games, Coach. Notre Dame, Seton Hall, Troy Murphy, 28 points, 15 rebounds. Well, he's a monster. I'll tell you what, he's, what a year that kid had. One of the best freshman years in the history of the league. Ty Shine, big game for Seton Hall, and Chuck Moore, some key baskets down the stretch. I thought this was a great Seton Hall win. I, I think that most people expected Notre Dame to come out and play at a level, and uh, Seton Hall did it. They took it right to them. Syracuse Boston College, the Orange set a record for the margin of victory, winning by 41. Yeah, this one was, uh, you know, you could predict this one. It was a tough year for the BC kids, and Syracuse a little bit on a mission, so you just have to say, well, you know, that's the way it goes, and uh, the BC kids, I think, gave an honest effort, but big difference in talent. Villanova and West Virginia, and Villanova had a roar from behind in this one, thanks to John Celestan, with 21 in the second half. Yeah, you got to give these guys credit, because... You know, these, these are the kind of games that can get away from you. And I, I felt West Virginia started to gain confidence all game. And Villanova got a wake-up call and snapped out of it. And, and it's a great job by Villanova. Got a little ugly in this Georgetown-Providence game for a while. Kevin Braswell, nice move down the stretch. Providence down two here with a chance to tie Kev, but couldn't come through. Yeah, I, I knew this was going to be a war and come down to the wire. Both these teams are very aggressive young teams. They do a terrific job, and uh, it, it was a great game. Speaking of wars, Thursday quarterfinal, Seton Hall and UConn, who would have expected it? No, it's, it, they, again, Seton Hall did a wonderful job of controlling tempo and, and taking the things away that UConn likes to do, and that's not easy to do. Uh, you have to give them credit. And he tried to miss the free throw there, Gary Saunders, but he made it. See, some things just never work right. It ends up a 57-56 win for UConn. Syracuse and Villanova, the Orange been winning this ball game by a 15th time in tournament history. They move into the semis. Yeah, well, they've got it going. I tell you what, I wouldn't want to see them in the NCAA tournament. I think Syracuse and Villanova really, I think, finished their seasons very well, have a nice blend of inside-outside and are, you know, both teams that could make an NCAA tournament run. Johnny Hemsley with a three icing this ball game for Miami over Georgetown, 64 to 54. Let's go to Friday in the semifinals, Syracuse and UConn. Well, UConn all of a sudden I think just had a little bit of a wake-up call and for whatever reason they, they got their, their legs back and they just played great basketball the rest of the tournament. Kevin Freeman on fire in this tournament. Miami against St. John's, Eric Barkley a big three down the stretch. The Johnnies win it by three. Good ball game. Yeah, I think everybody was waiting for this game. Uh, they're similar teams. They really go after each other. And uh, the home team prevailed. Championship ball game, never really close. UConn 13-0 burst out of the gate. Surprised me. I really thought that you know this was going to be a war right down to the end. But UConn has found their game. And, uh, boy, they couldn't find it at a better time. That's around the Big East. Brought to you by New Jersey Transit. A heck of a 20th. Big East Tournament. A short break. We'll be back with some final thoughts in a moment. <laughs> Rutgers opening round NIT game this Wednesday night at the Rack. Hofstra Flying Dutchman 22-9. and And Kevin, it's a good local matchup. And it's time to turn the page, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, you know, you've got to get your kids in the right mindset. And I think our kids are, that this is the second season. It's an, another chance for us to go out and make, make a statement about our program, grab some quality wins, and uh, we're very excited about being in the tournament. The importance of keeping your fans enthusiastic. Well, that's important. I, I don't know if everyone understands that you don't get home games in the NIT <laughs> unless you're going to draw some people. And uh, we, we hope that we can not only win some games, but win them at home. Coach, good luck. Thank you, Bruce. All right, we'll see you next week for our look back at the NIT and hopefully a look ahead. I'm Bruce Beck for the Coach Kevin Bannon. Have a great week. Seven teams getting in from any one conference, particularly given the way that Minnesota and Purdue played at the end of the year. I had some problems with three Missouri Valley teams getting in.
to the tournament, uh, and I would have liked to seen Xavier and Rutgers get a closer look. I understand why Xavier didn't get in the losses, the five losses, the teams between 100 and 150. I guess I understand why Rutgers didn't get in based on their last two weeks of the season, but they're not the only team that kind of took a slide in the last couple of weeks. I mean, they, they had 18 wins, nine wins in a very good league that I think will be proven out during the course of the tournament to be one of the two or three best leagues in the country. And I would like to see that program get another look. I, I think the message that was really conveyed here by the selection committee was, it's more important how you finish than what your RPI is. I think you're absolutely right, except, you know, if that were the case, then you would think Charleston would be better than an eight seed. I mean, I know that it's a Southern Conference thing, but you know what? Didn't stop from making Princeton a four last year. Right. It's kind of weird because these power conferences never end up with worse than a nine or a ten seed. Yeah, this is the first year I could say, I mean, it's interesting. Oklahoma was a 13 this year. I, I mean, so obviously they were the last team in. I had some serious questions whether they should have gotten in. You could they have scored 30-something points in their yeah, turn. Well, okay, I, I mean, the biggest, yeah, that, I mean, that's a major issue. And they're playing Oklahoma State, which is a team that's going to play a 50 to 47 in most games. But still, you would think Oklahoma's team which is likes to play up tempo which had beaten Arkansas 30 in December would be able to uh, put more firepower on the board hoops teams such as Kentucky that are putting it together right now how are you thanks uh, before I get to Rutgers Mr. Weiss can you please explain to me why Oklahoma gets in here's a team I believe they have not won a game the last four years in the tournament Manhattan knocked them out three years ago are they better than Rutgers uh, listen, I, I, I had Rutgers penciled into my bracket, okay? So you don't have to sell me on Rutgers. Yeah, I feel, and I had them going in all along, and yeah, I, I, I guess feel really bad. Now, now, I mean, obviously, I, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I, I like Kevin. I appreciate what he's done to that program, uh, and I felt very badly for him. But uh, they put themselves in a, a situation. They hadn't been in the tournament for a while. They become a bubble team after they lose the uh, Star Ledger shootout to, to, Seton, to Seton Hall, and then they lose the, uh, a home home game at Georgetown and I just think that uh, uh, it's an unfortunate situation. The thing that surprised me the, the most, Bruce, is ESPN puts a list of 10 teams on the bubble Sunday. Rutgers isn't even among them. Now, Fort Rutgers was still on the board at the You know, end. I remember seeing that. That was crazy because that everyone was, crazy, was still talking about them. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel really bad. I mean, my guess is Oklahoma's an early out again this year. I think so, too. I like Arizona, too. Uh, I pick Arizona to beat Michigan State. We'll talk more about that later. But I think they're, they're certainly capable of beating them in the top part of the Midwest bracket. By the way, Rutgers will be on our air. We're really excited about this as well at CNA. Uh, the ball game between Rutgers and Hofstra tomorrow and it's a good game flying dutchman are 22 and 9 they've had a good year they got speedy claxton and norman richardson they got a lot of good talent yeah actually they don't have speedy claxton oh he's hurt yeah <laughs> well yeah they have a great guard in speedy claxton uh this team though is interesting and i think it's going to be a good ball game you'll see it on c and eight don Cricky, rob kennedy and the pride of sports talk kenny henderson all will call the action that's on tomorrow night live at 7 30 on c and a quick thought before we go to break good ball game huh i hope so i just hope the record P seniors are not deflated from from, from not making I, I mean uh, Jeff Bellin is as nice as they come and you know I mean, it's, it's such a loyal family to the university I'd like to see him finish on an up note all right we'll take a short break more coming up with hoops Weiss and your phone NIT got in the way yesterday. Seton Hall was knocked out by Old Dominion, but Rutgers and Princeton are still alive. Rutgers kept its postseason going by beating Hofstra 58-45. The Scarlet Knights got their usual spark from junior Joel Salvi. And senior guard Jeff Billett, who led all scores with 15 points to help keep his college basketball career alive. Our season, if we lost, was over. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to end it in the first round of the NIT. You know, we felt, felt we were a better team than that. And so we wanted to, you know, at least get through the first round and now move on and see what happens. But, you know, winning that first round game was important because, you know, if you're losing the first round of any tournament, it feels like you weren't even a part of it. Billet will have at least one more game here. They'll host Clemson on Tuesday night. Back to you, Ken. Jerry, thank you. Mm -hmm. Some of the most important... The colleges, Rutgers is on to the second round of the NIT. Tickets already on sale for Tuesday night. Rutgers will host Clemson. The rack only about half full, though, last night. A very sluggish first half effort on the part of Rutgers. They struggled to beat Hofstra. Two-point game at the half, but RU got it going in the second 20 minutes. Put a nice run together, won it by 13, and now here come the Clemson Tigers. I know a lot about Clemson. Um, I worked uh, camp this summer 
uh, with almost all their players and uh, and their, their coaching staff I know very well too because they recruited my brother. So uh, so I know all the guys down there very well and they're great players. They're a great team. Um, you know, they had some injuries this year and that, you know that's probably why they're not in the NCAA tournament. But uh, it's going to be a tough game. And They've got some big guys, uh, a physical team, and uh, you know we'll see. We're going to we got a few days to get ready for it, practice. Uh, which is more than we have during the season, so I'm sure we'll get, uh, you know, we'll get uh, some film and we'll get to address some things that we need to try to do against uh, Clemson. Princeton is also into the second round. The Tigers are pretty methodical last night. Um, yeah, kind of my second question is, guys, um, last night on ESPN, Digger Phelps said he thinks Rutgers can win the NIT. What do you think about that? And do you know if, if they're going to get the home game against Clemson? It is home. They will be playing Clemson at the rack. Mike, thanks a lot for the telephone call. You know, it's funny. When you look at the NIT field, there are very few conferences that are going to send, at least as a power conference, a sixth-place team, the quality of Rutgers, into a field other than the field of 64. So I would think Rutgers would have a heck of a chance to at least get to Madison Square Garden and possibly play in the games there. And I would think, Tim, that, you know, if you look at the history of the NIT, the teams that play at Madison Square Garden, normally the following following year are able to use that as a nice building block and they seem to fare pretty well in the field of 64 should they make it the next year. Well I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the issue with Rutgers is are they going to be ready to play. I think last night, you know, I didn't see the game but I listened to it on the radio. I wonder if the kids were a bit disappointed they weren't playing in the NCAA tournament. I hope that as momentum gets and they understand when they're playing a, a Clemson in the next round and they're playing them at home and the place is filled. I hope they understand how important these games, is, these games are and what a great thrill it would be to play it in the NIT at Madison Square Garden. Believe me, the NIT committee is going to give them home games. They want Rutgers to get to the Garden. They want it to be a hometown, uh, hometown favorite, and they have a real shot. I would be much more concerned about their mental outlook than I would their physical ability. They certainly have that, and I just want Billet and Hodgson to go out and, you know, on a high notes, and nothing would be a higher note than winning the NIT for them right now. Tomorrow morning, tickets, by the way, will go on sale at the rack. They're going to be selling them tomorrow, Saturday, Monday, and Tuesday as well. So if you'd like to see Rutgers play some postseason basketball against Clemson at the rack, you know, it could be a lot of fun. And if I were a Rutgers fan, I'd like to get out there and probably support them. Marvin Scotch playing. In second round action, the quarterfinal games are all at school sites, and then the final four of the NIT will be at Madison Square Garden in New York. The Scarlet Knights rely on Rob Hodgson and Jeff Billett. Clemson counts on Terrell McIntyre for scoring, but who else should we look for in that matchup? Well, you've got to have a chemistry player in each of these teams. We take a look, Rutgers, it's Dante Jones. They just love him. He gets on the glass. He's averaging about 10 points a game, four rebounds a game. Very aggressive. And every team has one of these players that you don't hear about much, but he makes things happen. That's Dante Jones. And, of course, when you look at Clemson, it comes down to Harold Jamison. Tough, big, strong. Chemistry player, yes. 15 points, 15 rebounds versus Georgia. Really solid on the glass. This is going to be a battle tonight at Rutgers, where tomorrow night, when you take a look at both of these players, I just really love what Dante Jones has done behind the scenes for Rutgers. And you take a look at Harold Jamison all year. He's been consistent for Clemson. And you have to remember, people say, well, NIT, well, they wish they were in the field of 64. But for the coaches, you know, you're also building for next year. So these games do have relevance. It sure does. But you've got to understand this, too. There's teams playing right now in the NIT. And there's teams not playing in the NCAA. And when you've got young teams and you've got young players, you want to give them game experience. And this is why the NIT is so important. Yeah. If you look at the Pac-10, Everybody's done except for Cal, the only team still going. Right. We'll talk about their fortunes later on. All right, from the pros, what do you say we now move on to the college hardwood at the rack in Piscataway tonight? We're Rutgers, Scarlet Knights. We'll look at the slade, the Clemson Tigers, in round two of the NIT. But here in the first half, it's the Tigers in control. Terrell McIntyre from three, drops a bomb dead on target, putting Clemson up by 11, 38, 27. Then here in the second half, it's McIntyre, the steal, one bounce to Harold Jamison, up and down a hatch. As Rutgers' season comes to an end, 78, 68, Clemson was the final. The ladies are still in it. And Piscataway, Rutgers eliminated from the second round of the NIT by 10 points to Clemson. First half after the missed shot, Tigers in transition. Vernon McIntyre, the alley-oop for Dustin Braddock. Rutgers down by 12 at recess. More of the same in the second half. After the turnover, Harold Jamison sends it home. Scarlet Knights lost 78-68. Their coach, Kevin Bannon, finishes the year at 19-13. and in tournament as far as Rutgers goes, the Scarlet Knights outgunned by Chris Braddock in Clemson, 78-68 Tigers the final. Hey, if you were thinking of going to...
second round action in the NIT. Rutgers hosting Clemson. Clemson in the road orange. Early first half. Where's the boxing out? Harold Jamison, the easy offensive follow. Part of a 17-0 run. Clemson by 11 at the half. Still more Clemson. Second half. Terrell McIntyre, the steal. There he goes. He led the Tigers with 16. 78-68 Clemson. The season is over for the Scarlet Knights. St. John's is in Knoxville. Rutgers has bowed out of the National Invitation Tournament, the court of the Scarlet Knights. Here they are, all riled up in a Big East versus ACC encounter, but Rutgers threw it all away. Clemson ran away to a 10-2 spurt to put it away. Harold Jameson icing on the cake. Clemson wins 78-68 in the final game for the Rutgers seniors Rob Hodgson and Jeff Billett. Rutgers ends up 19-13. and On a different campus. Last night, Clemson ended their season, and a couple of careers ended as well. Rob Hodgson and Middletown's Jeff Billett. That's, that's probably what I'm most proud of, and the thing I'll always remember is you know, each year our team got better, and I think, you know, that's, you can't ask for much more, um, you know, when you play somewhere for four years. And for Jeff and I, uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, great careers here. You know, we have nothing to be uh, you know, ashamed of. You know, the last loss is disappointing. It's always disappointing to go on a loss, but, you know, you hear every year that every team goes on a loss except for maybe two. I remember my last college game, I remember my last high school game, and uh, it's not good feelings. It's, not, it's really a lousy feeling, so. I told them I don't know what else they wanted. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure they might say an NCAA appearance, but I mean, come on, I, those kids, you know, Rutgers and, and Rob and Jeff has been a really great marriage. Yeah, that is very true. Hockey now, the... Everybody, I'm Dave Sims sitting in for Bruce Beck today. Welcome to the Kevin Bannon Show as we wrap up that 98-99 season. Good postseason for Rutgers as they got to the NIT. And Kevin steps in to join us right now. And we'll review, Coach. We'll start back with the Hofstra game. And you had to be real happy to go on into the postseason, not going into the NCAA, but going into the NIT. Good spot for your kids. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this year our goal was to get on the winning side of things and get into the postseason. And the opportunity to play in the NIT really excited our kids. And I thought, uh, you know, we were, we were all juiced up. It uh, hadn't been a long time since a Rutgers team has been in the postseason. So great opportunity for us. Sure enough and it's a good you know, more exposure and another recruiting tool for you guys too. Yeah I mean you know you look at it and you have a couple of seniors that you want to play in the postseason and then you have some young kids that you want to have that experience so down the road hopefully when we're an NCAA team you know you have that type of postseason experience. All right let's revisit some of the great moments from the uh, win against Hofstra and it happened back on Wednesday March 10th Jay Wright one of the bright young coaches in the game locally here has his team in town in Piscataway. Jeff Greer hits a layup here good move here good strong move. Yeah we needed that slashing. I mean, they're, they're a very good team defensive team, and you know, Jeff Greer opens things up for everybody when he gets to the rim. And how about Rashad Kent showing some real scrappiness here on the defensive end? You know, Rashad was probably about 50% healthy, and to see him on the floor like that was pretty inspiring to our guys. Millett hit a three-pointer, made it 13-11 for Rutgers, and Johnson here, tough shot here, but Joel Salvi, what a follow right there. Well, he did it for us all year. His activity really sparked our team, and with Rashad Hurt, we needed Joel to step up, and he did a great job for us. Real emotional kind of kid and then definitely pumps you guys up, no doubt about it. Jason Hernandez of Hofstra is going to hit a jumper here to keep Hofstra close. 15-14 Rutgers. Billet, though, is going to set up Greer for the layup to give Rutgers a 17-14 lead. I thought Hofstra did a real good job of coming out and having a good game plan. And, you know, they're a team that a lot of metropolitan area kids that were pretty fired up to play, to play against Rutgers and to play in the rack. And I thought they did a great job. That jumper by Billet made it 20-16. Here's Roberto Gittens off balance shot. 21-16. 20 with 224 to go and just before the end of the first half billet breaks the trap finds Hudson for the layup Rutgers 23 21 at the half second half off the uh, miss some great hustle Greer to billet to Dante Jones coming up right here yeah that, that was uh, Jeff Greer sparks it all by hustling the ball out of the corner and getting it swung away from their traps just like this play Dante gets it away from their traps and Greer finishes at the rim 31 26 Rutgers billet hits a three-pointer 10-point lead 38 28 and then Kent 
is going to be set up by Billet to make it 40 to 33. Great pick and roll there. Kent makes a good catch and a good finish around the basket. Like I said, you could see he couldn't even get off his feet, but his presence was really felt out there. 40 to 33 right here, and then the steal and dunk by Greer coming up to make it 49-33, and Rutgers goes on to win it by the count of 58 to 45 to advance to the second round in the NIT. Jeff Billet, solid game, 15 and 5. Good shooting, 3 for 6 from long range. How about Jeff Greer? 13 points against Hofstra. Yeah, Five Jeff, rebounds and three steals. Yeah, Jeff, I think, was the difference in the game. I mean, Jeff Billets missed a consistency at the point. Jeff Greer really did some great slashing and open court things for him. Rob Hudson. Good numbers as well, nine points, five rebounds, and three steals. And after the game, Ken Henderson spoke to Jeff Billick. The Hofstra played hard. They're, they're playing without probably their best player. And, you know, they really they really gave us all we could handle. And made a nice run in the second half, and, you know, we were able to open up a little bit of a lead. He had the big fella back today. He didn't score a lot, but he did a lot of other things. He was great. He uh, did a great job on the boards. He had six at halftime, so I don't know what he finished with, but uh, that inside presence, something we were missing in the Big East tournament. Uh, you know, it was, it was just great to see him back playing again. Jeff's always good at breaking down the importance of having that big fella in the middle. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jeff, I think Jeff's really pleased this year. We had a little more firepower around the basket and only opened things up for Jeff, and uh, he did a great job. Mr. Consistency for our ball club. No question about it. Now, after the win against Hofstra, let's take a look at how the NIT bracket shaped up. So Rutgers wins in the first round, heading into the second round against Clemson, and that would certainly be a tall order. Clemson coming out of the ACC. The ACC down a little bit, but I tell you what, Clemson and pretty formidable foe as we look at some of the other uh, the games in the brackets. Yeah, we knew when we drew Clemson that it was a very tough matchup for us because of their size. And any team that has a terrific little point guard combined with size and depth, you know, is, is trouble for anybody. But, you know, for us, we're not the most physical team in the world. So, you know, tough matchup for us. No question about it. And certainly you'll change that whole physical moniker for next year. But right now, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll see how Rutgers fared against the Clemson Tigers right after this here the Kevin Bannon show. Because they can't give up easy ones. The guards have to play them until the big guys return and Kent. Welcome back, everybody. Dave Sims for Bruce Beck here on the Kevin Bannon Show. And the second season continues for Rutgers when they take on the Clemson Tigers. And your thoughts on Clemson? I mean, a tough year in the ACC this year, but, boy, they're imposing physically. Yeah, I, I thought that this is a team that went through some struggles, uh, had two players thrown off the team in the middle of the season. But it's a senior-dominated team. They have tremendous physical strength. And any time you have a point guard like McIntyre that can control a game, it's a scary team. Yeah, no doubt about it. Clemson out of the ACC. Again, a down year, but still not a bad opponent for Rutgers. And let's take a look at some of those highlights. And uh, Rashad Kent, good to have him back. And so we look at Larry Sh uh, Shyatt, the first-year coach, the Greer. 7-0 run. You guys off to a fantastic start right here. Yeah, I mean, we started so well. We get a sellout crowd. Everything was going our way. And then you just have to take your hat off to Clemson. They matched our run with, like, a 15-point run. It was incredible. Jameson, big, powerful uh, power forward up front, 7-all before you knew it. And then uh, Solomon is going to get it done on both ends with the jumper and then the steal. This one really hurt. Yeah, they, they um, you know, when somebody comes into your house, you, you, you want to get them on their heels. You don't want them to get a comfort level. We did that with the 7-0 run. But then when they started to make their run, we didn't answer, and it just became too much of a run for us. Yeah, they had a 17-0 run, and uh, Jones is there for the putback right here. Makes it 17-14 Clemson. Well, Dante played a super game for us. I mean, he showed all the things that he can do to help you win. Defensively, he hit three. He got to the rim. I mean, he really played a super game for us. Dante Jones, I tell you what, impacted large on your ball club this year. Greer's going to hit a three-pointer. Rutgers within two, 24-22 Clemson. Well, we answered that run. That gave us hope there, you know, towards the end of the half. But, again, they found people. They made plays. And they're, they're a veteran ball club. Now you got to give them credit. 33-26 at that point. And then Solomon dishes to Weidman. He misses. Gets the tip. 40-29 Clemson. Clemson 16 second-chance points in the first half for the 40-29 lead. 
Missed by Billet there. Kent's going to get the rebound and one. 40 to 33 at this point. Clemson. Well, we made you know we made a run to start the half. Got back in the game. Uh, got Rashad involved. We didn't get him involved in the first half. He was in foul trouble, so that was very very important for us. Heck of a pass there by McIntyre to Allensbach. 49-35. Clemson. Loose ball. Collins will finish this one off. Well, this is what we had planned. I mean, we really wanted to have a night where our defense created a little bit of up tempo and we got our wings out in the open court. Unfortunately, we didn't get enough. Hudson hits a 350-348. Time running down, though. But you're still hanging tough. Here's Billet. Gets a three. Cuts the lead down to 55-51. to Yeah, we just got ever so close. You know, we dug a hole for ourselves. But, boy, we got right back. We never could get over the hump. Kent for the layup, 57-53. But here's the deal getting sealed right here by Solomon. 63-53. Clemson never looked back. And Rutgers proud of its seniors, Hudson and Billet, as they exit their final game at at the rack. It was so good to see the kind of, I mean, I'm not surprised, but the ovation that those guys, well-deserved ovation. Dante Jones, solid, solid numbers, 20 points, four rebounds, and three steals. Yeah, Dante showed everything that he can do for us. I mean, great game for Dante at both ends of the floor. And Rob Hudson in his final 31 minutes, 13 and five, the numbers he came up for last night. And here's a look at Jeff Gray, 11 points, three assists, and one steal. Well, I thought Jeff finished the season real positive. He's going to be one of our leaders. He'll be a junior next year. We're really going to count on him. Do a little quick overview of the season. What are your, your first thoughts a day, you know, a day after uh, the season ends? Well, I, you know, I feel like our kids really gave me a lot. It was a fantastic season in terms of you know, all the sellouts we had. I mean, everything about the program took the next step, and that's really what you want to happen. I thought our kids did a good job. We faded down the stretch a little bit, but I think as we have more experienced players, that's not going to happen. Yeah, indeed. Good year, though. Very good year. I think you guys impressed a lot of folks in the Big East and around the nation. When we come back, we'll take a look at two values members of this Rutgers 98-99 ball club. Two seniors who were really big for this club, Rob Hudson and Jeff Billett. We'll do that right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Dave Sims for Bruce Beck here on the Kevin Bannon Show. And Kevin, let's talk about one of the, uh, the parts of the season. You went 19 and 13. When was it that it sort of kicked in and says, you know what, we're not bad. We can really do some damage here in this 98-99 uh, well, season. Well, we had some good non-league wins, you know, Princeton, and we, we won uh, out, split out in Ohio, losing, I mean, in, in uh, Hawaii, lost to uh, a great Auburn team, as you know, but had a good win over Wichita State. But I think when we, when we had uh, two league wins in December, uh, going down to Georgetown and winning and, and hosting Providence and winning, I think our kids got a lot of confidence. And, um, you know, and we made a, a steady progression, which was terrific. And then we just seemed to fade a little bit at the end. And, uh, but I, I thought the kids were, you know, really played at a high level. And definitely there was significant progress from the prior year. Yeah, certainly the, the low point was losing a Seton Hall and Georgetown back to back in that last week of the yeah, season. And, and, you know, we're, the thing about that is you know we were ever so close because you know both games you know we have the ball to tie or to win in the last minute after you know making up a big deficit we just seemed to run out of gas so you know there's a little bit of frustration with the way that we finished yeah but you know I don't want that to diminish what the kids did accomplish you know we haven't had a winning season in an awful long time we uh, we moved up the road in, in in the Big East we moved up the pack I mean we were a win away from a four seed we ended up a six seed uh, so the kids, you know, really did a terrific job as far as, you know, just taking it up another notch. Yeah, a lot of people noticed, too. <laughs> no question about that. 19-13, and 13, the record for Rutgers uh, this season. And certainly uh, Rob Hodson and Jeff Billett played huge portions in that. And let's take a look at Rob. And this was the perfect game against uh, West Virginia. He went 11 for 11. Unbelievable game. And everybody should have one of these to keep and show their kids. Unfortunately, I don't have one. Maybe you do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this was that kind of game for Rob. He'd go inside. He'd go outside. He was killing from three. Uh, he always plays good defense and rebounds for us. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it just shows you what, what kind of ability. And when we were hitting on all cylinders this, this year, which was, you know, for a lot of the season, a lot of that was Rob because he's a tough matchup for the other team's four man because he's got the range on his shot and the mobility. 12th all-time in Rutgers scoring. Some good numbers. 
for the transfer from Indiana. 1,275 points. When, did he have a breakthrough moment? I mean, that, that had to have been a breakthrough moment right there against West Virginia, right? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think this whole year, really, except for the finish a little bit, Rob took everything up another notch. You know, and he played at a higher level than he had played the previous season. And um, we needed that desperately from him. And he, A, he was a third-team all-league player, which in our league this year, that's, that's a major accomplishment. Yeah, no question about it. <laughs> this year in the Big East, not a bad campaign. Talk about Jeff Billett. He was outstanding again. He finished last year on a strong note, this against Georgetown in the Big East tournament, and he just picked it up from there. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, uh, I thought, you know, made a, the adjustment very well. Last year, we played him at the point a little bit, played him at the two most of the time. This year, the best thing for us was for him to play the point. And boy, was he rock solid. And, you know, the kind of kid he is, Jeff didn't get as many shot attempts. He was more of a setup guy this year. But he was just so consistent. His assist to turnover ratio is tremendous, almost three to one. And just, just you know, he left his mark on the program. But more than anything, it's just his consistency. Sure enough, all-time three-point maker at Rutgers. 1,480 points, ninth on the all-time scoring list. The, the, the good thing there is that the family tradition will continue. His brother's coming in next year. He's been heralded uh, as one of the great point guards in the country, so that's uh, good news for the Rutgers program. Yeah, just to have the Billet family involved in our program. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, kids have certain personality traits that they have, and the, the Billets have instilled in their sons their winners in every way, shape, and form. So, you know, Jeff will still be around the program. We inherit Todd, who's a terrific player, and we keep mom and pop around the program which is pretty good too. <laughs> Talk about the leadership of Hodgson and Billet during the course of the season too. See I, I, I'm very fortunate that I to inherit these two. I didn't recruit these two guys right. and to inherit people I said after the game look you, you guys left your mark on the program there's no doubt about it with all the statistical things that you did but what I appreciate you know being in coaching as long as I have is I, don't, I can't remember two seniors that brought more to the table in terms of just being consistent winners do all the right things say all the right things yeah. you know and uh, you know in this day and age uh, you know people want but they don't always give and these guys just lace them up every day first guys in the gym last guys to leave don't miss class great ambassadors for the program pretty emotional night last night saying goodbye to these guys I had to have been and uh, it was nice to have had a full house at the rack to conclude the season against Clemson right now let's take a look for the final time of the 98-99 season our Dunkin Donuts hoop of the week and a pretty easy selection here a guy named Salvi <laughs> jumps in to your picture here watch this well you know Joel is uh, when he gets his hoops those are the kind of hoops he gets he's not, there's nothing pretty about Joel's game except it's all guts and right there he just goes up he has great instincts great athleticism and that's what he does he gives us those emotional plays that fires everybody up and what a year he had for us the Dunkin Donuts hoop of the week Joel Salvi job well done for a guy who really brings a lot of energy to your ball club that's impressive yeah I mean Joel's uh, progression as as the year went on he became the crowd favorite he became a guy that gave us such a lift off the bench the kids in the audience with the, the salvi wigs and everything I mean that's good stuff you know and he <laughs> he loves it I said Joel you can wear your socks and your hair any way you want just keep rebounding and scoring around the basket you can't have enough guys like that we'll come back in a moment and take a look at the future it looks pretty bright for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights basketball team we'll do that right after this. So the 98-99 campaign is history. 19-13, and 13, the record for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. And Kevin Bannon, let's look towards the future. What are we talking about here for 99 and ought ought, if you will? And well, I, I hope I'm not a coach that's sitting here next year saying oh, we're not big enough, we're not strong enough. I don't think I'm going to say that because we did a great job of addressing specifically our needs. And, and our needs, there's more size and more bulk around the basket, and then we needed a good point guard. So we start there with Todd Billett, a uh, terrific point guard, one of the best in the country, uh, and he'll just do a great job for us. And, uh, you know, going down the list, we, we added a lot of size and strength. And Sean Exani from Red Bank, 6'7", about 225. Josh Moore from St. Thomas Moore, 7'1", about 290. Whoa. Kareem Wright, 6'9", uh, about 3'10". So, you know, all good players. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a very solid recruiting class. And, of course, what you want to do is address your needs. And I think we obviously did that. And these four players 
We're talking about immediate impact. You see these guys, you know, being in your rotation. I think so. I mean, that's hard to say. With you know, I think obviously we have a glaring need for a point guard, and Todd sees that he has a great opportunity. I think the other stuff is just going to be some tremendous competition, and uh, with some big players going yeah. after each other. We have Eugene Dabney, who sat out this year, who is a 6'10", very skilled big man. In addition to the young fe fellows that I just mentioned, so there'll be some real good, healthy competition, and uh, hopefully we're we're just got, not going to get beat up the way we did at. at times this yeah, year. Yeah, understood. Uh, you'll be as big as anybody in the conference. That, that's going to be good. And it's all going to be led by, by Todd Billett. And it's it, 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 for you, the comfort level knowing that you're basically taking the keys out of one kid's hand and giving it to him, I mean, he, he, you know that he can run this show. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is, you know, they are, they're brothers, they're different people, and they're, they're different players, you know. And like I said, the common denominator is that they're Billets, and they bring so much to the table as far as attitude and just, you know, just great kids. But as a player, Todd just excites you because, you know, he can hit the deep three. He makes everybody around him better. You know, he's been, um, people call him a John Stockton type of player. And I think wow. that's a good parallel, you know, because he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He really gets the ball to people. He can, he can play very fast, and he can also play a setup game for you. So I think the kid's just going to have a monster, monster career in a Rutgers uniform, and I'm very excited about coaching him. Boy, I tell you what, you ought to be too, because now you got that inside-outside game, because he showed in that clip we, we just had there the long three that you mentioned, but now he's got somebody down in the low block, so now you can have a nice inside-outside combo. Well, you have to. You know, if you want to be in the upper echelon of the league and you want to be a postseason team, you know, perennially, it, it's like, You've got to have that. You know, you have to have that balance. And I think that's where there's a lot of little point guards that can make plays. But when you add making plays and deep threes to that, pretty hard to defend kids like that. Yeah. And, and as we all know, shooting's a lost start in the game of <laughs> yeah. basketball. Yeah, these that's days. for sure. <laughs> it's hard to believe. I tell you what, but it is the truth. Take our final time out and come back and do a big reflection on the 98-99 campaign. A little music video for you. It's coming your way in a moment. The 98-99 campaign for Rutgers has been a magnificent year, 19 and 13. They make the postseason going to the NIT, and the future looks absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's been a, it was a fun year. Great group of guys to coach. They gave me every ounce that they had, and, and we made significant progress in every way, shape, and form, and so it's been great. And doing the show, Dave, it's been great doing the show with you, Bruce, our technical crew, Ken Henderson, our producer. I really enjoy doing this, and uh, thank, thank you to everybody for tuning in. Well, he's done a great job, and we look forward to the season coming up next October. Boy, when they start to tee it up, November, actually, when they tee it up, it'll be a great win for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. They're going to have some youth. They're going to have some size. They're going to have some speed and a real good point guard. For Bruce Beck, I'm Dave Sims. Thanks for joining us here on the Kevin Bannon Show, and we'll see you next season, everybody, for Rutgers Basketball.
don't hear really much about them, even though especially Flores put up some unbelievable high school numbers. I was curious if uh, what, you, what you heard about them. Uh, you know what? I'm going to have to get Kevin Bannon on the horn for you and uh, give you some credentials in terms of attributes for these guys. I think they had a very good recruiting class. A lot of times you try to pick up some additional guys because a couple of players, you know, there's spots open for them. Right. But they had a very good year. They got Billet coming in. They got Sean Exani coming in. They're hoping to get Josh Moore in the program. I mean, you look around the Big East, they had one of the two or three best recruiting seasons. And they needed a couple players to, to go with Greer. And, and to go with some of the guys they have, I think Kent is going to be a terrific ball player. We saw Dante Jones put on a show in a couple ball games this year. So there's a lot of players back there. There's a lot of uh, pieces to the puzzle. And we'll find out what these two guys can bring to the table as well for you, Dave, in the days ahead. But I think that Kevin Bannon and Rutgers are really on the right track. Do you think they can somehow crack into the top three or four in the Big East, or is that too much to ask? Well, what you look for first, really, is to get into the upper echelon. You want to get into the tournament, the NCAA tournament, and I think this year they made a you know, big step by getting to a postseason. They really had an NCAA bid locked up if they hadn't faded down the stretch. Right. I think you got to look at the upper echelon, which is top five or six, and then you go and worry about challenging a Syracuse or a UConn and, and really get into that, that next level. I, I think you're right about that. Uh, I think this team has the ability. I think Rutgers has been a sleeping giant for many years. They've got that truncated pyramid known as the rack, which is one of the best home courts <laughs> in all of college hoops. It really is. It's a perfect size, and the fans were very supportive this year. They had tremendous turnouts. I, I think you have to walk before you run, but the best way to judge Kevin Bannon is after four or five full years when he's got his whole chance to recruit, and what he's done so far I think has been very admirable. Yeah, he's a, actually a terrific coach, and a good friend of mine played for him at, down at Trenton State. Really? He, he still, he still stays in touch with him, and he says he's a tremendous guy as That's, well. He really is a lot of fun, and I'll get that information for you, David, to, to share in those ball players. okay? Hey, Kevin Banner, we got you on the phone? Bruce, how you doing? Coach, what a pleasure. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got David from Livingston who called up a couple moments ago, talked about two of your newer recruits, and, you know, I'm not in touch with them as much as I was the Exani and, and Billet and the other group, but uh, can you share some thoughts with us? Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. tell us those two guys and, and what they bring to the table. Well, the first guy is Michael Thompson. Um, he's a guy that's uh, got a little bit of a complex background. He's a guy that played uh, in New Zealand and was brought over, played high school ball in Minnesota, and uh, had a great senior year and was recruited by Utah and uh, Iowa State and signed with Brigham Young. Played as, uh, started as a freshman at BYU and uh, decided to go on a church mission for two years and that's where he's been in South Carolina basically on a church mission and we uh, it's a long story we won't world go into traveler. it now. Huh? A world traveler Kevin. Yeah, he, he's absolutely a world traveler um, we have some mutual friends and I got a chance to go down and see Mike play a number of times this year and uh, we feel great about him he's a 6'7 forward a lot like a Rob Hodgson he's very athletic can play the 3 can play the 4 and um, as you know, sometimes when they take those missions, they come back. They're they're a little rusty, but they're a little older and a little more mature and uh, very coachable. Yeah, well, I think he's going to be real coachable, and uh, he'll go back to New Zealand this summer, playing a great league this summer, and I think he'll be get some of the cobwebs out. And the nice thing is, he's eligible immediately, and he'll have three years of eligibility. So we're pretty That's excited terrific. about Mike. Okay. And the other guy? is Luis Flores, who's who played in the New York uh, Public League and uh, is a terrific, I think, a terrific guard. He can play the point, can play the two, and uh, is a guy that can shoot the three. He played, uh, I think he came in second in the Nike um, Classic in the Garden this year where they had uh, some of the best players around in the dunk contest and a shooting contest. He's a good shooter with long range, put the ball on the floor, tough kid, good friends with uh, Jeff Greer, grew up in the same neighborhood as Jeff Greer. Washington Heights? Yeah, and he's, uh, I just think he's a real good player. And sometimes, you know, the kids peak pretty early. They become a big name. This is a guy a lot like a Jeff Greer who peaked in his senior year. And we feel fortunate enough to get him. We feel like uh, people were really coming in on him at the end. And we had to battle it out a little bit with Pitt and George Washington. And we were able to sign him. So we That's feel real terrific. good. 
two good students and uh, two players that I think kind of fit what we needed to bring in to kind of cap off what I consider a very good recruiting class. That's what I was going to ask you. These guys are more components that, that fit in, like they're maybe not the well-known blue chip or some of the guys you got early, but they're the, the pieces to the puzzle that you have to fill if you're going to be a power in the league. Yeah, I think, you know, when you go out early and you sign players early, you know, you know, what your needs. With us, it was size. So right. getting a Josh Moore, getting a Kareem Wright, Sean Exani, and then definitely a point guard, and we got a great one in Todd Billett. And then I think you play your season and you look at your team and you look at your kids and, and uh, you see what scholarships you have available, and a couple scholarships popped up for us, and we really felt like, okay, what do we need to complement what we have? We're excited about what we have coming back, but what are the few little pieces that we have missing? And we feel with these two guys, we plugged a couple of gaps, and, and I just feel good. You know, right now we, we're young. We have an awful lot of freshmen and sophomores in the program, and this is a team that we're going to grow with, but uh, we feel great about the potential. All right, Coach, we appreciate you joining us on such short notice, and we hope to uh, tee it up with you in the near future. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Coach. So that's Kevin Bannon, and there's your answer, David. Uh, that's pretty timely. We'll take a short business break. We'll come back with more on Sports Talk in just a moment. Now it's nice to be wanted. Two local coaches entertained phone calls recently from other schools. Last night we told you about FDU's Tom Green talking with Fordham. The job went to Bob Hill. Rutgers' Kevin Bannon, meantime, got a phone call from the University of Minnesota. In fact, he got two phone calls. Minnesota looking to replace Clem Haskins, but Kevin says he was never really interested in the Gophers. He does appreciate the call, though. All right, tomorrow night we settle the Jersey. Today he announced his college choice. And can anybody be hard to believe, but as of tomorrow, college basketball is back. Here it is, the eve of the start of practice, and Rutgers gets a verbal commitment from one of the best players in New Jersey. Hervé Lamazana will wear scarlet. The senior at St. Patrick's in Elizabeth is headed to Rutgers next year. Some have him in the top 30 of all recruits nationwide. He is six foot nine with a ton of potential, and he told us why he chose RU. I'm comfortable, pretty friendly with the coach, and uh, I feel good with the team. I got my boys there, Dante Jones, Goff Billet, and Todd Billet, I mean, and um, I just feel comfortable. I feel like he's the right place for me, that's all. Well, that's enough. And this is Kevin Bannon's first recruit for the year 2000 season. He's got a couple more scholarships to give out yet. But this is a good get, make no mistake. Hervé was also looking at uh, Villanova, Syracuse, and Maryland. But he's going to stay close to home for college. Uh, high school volleyball. Now begins the Rutgers portion of our programming. The men's soccer program, in fact, off to a great start. Now holding on to first place in the Big East and head coach Rutgers Athletic Center, the men's basketball team gearing up for a new season. Some familiar names are gone. Forwards Jeff Billett and Rob Hodgson lost to graduation. Guard Earl Johnson, out of here, transferred out of town. But with the new season comes some new faces, and that includes a new billet. Todd, in fact, and hopefully for Rutgers fans, continued improvement. News 12's John Marks has more. If you look up the word youth in the Big East Basketball Dictionary, this is the picture you'll find beside it. Eight of these 12 scholarship players are underclassmen, and six of them have never played a minute in one of college basketball's toughest conferences. We're going to find out a lot about ourselves. There's no doubt in my mind that we're going to, be, uh, we're going to have some bumps in the road. This is a team we're going to have to be patient with. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to be able to play at a high level, but we're also going to possibly you know have our have our moments and with all those new faces the guys who have been around will need to step up right away and show some leadership now sophomores aren't normally asked to do that but Rashad Kent and Dante Jones both know full well what's expected of them leading by example it just means for me to have the ability to say something and whoever I say something to doesn't have the opportunity to say something back to me that's basically what leading by example is because I, I really want to to have no reason for somebody to be able to say, well, hey, look, you're not giving 110%, so why should I? Well, now I just have it upon me just to, just to help my team, help the newcomers, just to get more adjusted and just guide them a little bit like Rob Hodge and Jeff, Jeff Bill did last year for me. The Knights open the exhibition season November 3rd and then play 15 more before their Big East opener against Syracuse. Those are 16 important opportunities for this young team to convince themselves that they can win. In Piscataway, John Marks, News 12, New Jersey. 
And some football for the first time. Exhibition game with Marathon Oil. Rashad Kent was, as usual, handling the blue collar stuff under the glass, put back there. Rashad coming off the big freshman year. He's one of the young guys RU will depend on this season. They'll depend on Jeff Greer, too. 19 points for Jeff tonight. Of course, the guy everyone is curious about is Todd Billett, the freshman from Christian Brothers. He had his moments. It's going to take these guys a little while to get things together. Rutgers lost tonight, 76-66. High school tennis, the best. Transition to college basketball, resulting chemistry issues with the players that are already there. It's a theme all over New Jersey this season. News 12's Joey Waller tonight checking in with the big three. Prince just one letter can make, as in going from NIT to NCAA. The difference could lie in the hands of freshman point guard Todd Billett, who hopes the season's start will put an end to questions about brother Jeff. I think they'll gradually gradually disappear and, and as the team starts getting into the season and winning and, and get, get the hopes on the Big East and, and the NCAA tournament, then everything will be focused on that. And I think it's really going to be a situation where we kind of have two seasons this year. We have the season leading up to the Big East schedule where I think we're going to try to give a lot of people opportunities to play and see how that pans out and then hopefully we can settle in on a nine or ten man rotation come uh, January. Meanwhile in Princeton, two words describe the Tigers' two teams to cover. I guess let's start with the Pirates. Uh, they, I think, uh, Kevin Bannon's got to work six new guys, and so that really he's the chemist. <laughs> Can he get them all to play together? Right. Well, of course, the key in doing that, to say the least, will be the freshman point guard, Tom Billett. Now, fortunately for Rutgers and Kevin Bannon, the early returns on Billett have been strong, but I think the key for this team overall is more so the guys who are returning. Guys like Rashad Kent, Dante Jones, Jeff Greer, think about it. They really don't have to play out of their minds in order for Rutgers to surprise this year. I think even if they only progress at a level at a normal pace that you'd expect from guys of this level of talent, then Kevin Bannon may be right. You know, Kurt, what he's been telling people is we lost Hodgson, we lost Billet. I still think we can be better. Skeptics are saying mm, maybe Kevin's been at that rum candy again, but he may be right before it's all over. Yeah, definitely a better team towards the end of the year than they will be to start the season. Right. Uh, Princeton, you brought up a great point. They've got experienced sophomores, and this is a new thing for the team. The ball is back tonight. Rutgers and Ryder tipped off the season. This one was all Scarlet Knights. Jeff Greer with a triple. Rutgers put it away early, 74-49. Kevin Bannon's bunch starts with a win. College basketball is starting up all over New Jersey. Princeton to 62 and Rutgers, 74-49 over Ryder. Hockey into Fran Fraschilla and New Mexico. And the Red Storm made up for land. Out of the guard. Rutgers home with one of those games you circle on the schedule and say, that's a gimme. But against Charleston Southern, was it? Let's check it out. Rutgers coach Kevin Bannon has a knees-eye view of the action, and he had to like what he saw early on, even from the floor. Freshman Todd Billett picking up where brother Jeff left off to Dante Jones to Rashad Kent. Hello. Kent tied his career high with 20 points tonight. Then Kent double-teamed underneath. Watch this. Breaks the double-team outside to Dante. Two. Very nice. And more Dante Jones, the sophomore. Look at this move coming up. Cutting in here, a hot knife through butter. Oh, that's nice. 77-63, the final Rutgers win. Um, we finished up the half with a nice little run, and um, that got us excited, and we came out, and we wanted to put the game away. The yeah, coach is just basing everything on defense right now. Just our pressure just is dictating games right now, as you saw in the Ryder game and in this one. So we're just trying to come out and try to shut the team's offenses down, and then that's when our offense is going to come. On the scoreboard, the Knights of FDU. Oh! Picked up two quality wins, and today they took down the Nebraska Cornhuskers. They pulled away in the second half and won it pretty easily. You know, six years ago, uh, Wally Dixon wore the uniform of the Scarlet Knights, a kid with a lot of potential. Things have never quite worked out for him out at Rutgers, but things are working out just fine now. Garden Variety Sports tonight. Whatever happened to Wally Dixon? You saw Joey Waller with the answer. Old story, new twist. Wally Dixon of Linden, Rutgers star basketball recruit, 1993. Dixon, what a highlight film this guy is. Wally Dixon has difficulties with grades and the coach, and in two years, gone. But a funny thing happens on the way to basketball oblivion. I got the heart, 
Uh, I know I get that from just playing, growing up, living in Jersey. The new sports clothing company, And One, discovers Dixon playing street ball. He gets a unique endorsement deal, appearing in promotional videos and in an upcoming commercial, playing in celebrity games and wearing their sneakers. I knew from like almost a day of birth that I would be successful playing basketball. But why choose Dixon? And one is marketing street players like Dixon. Well, actually, I came to them, and I was so eager and showing them what I have to bring to the table to where it was like they really couldn't turn me down. In Harlem's legendary Rucker League, Dixon is called the main event thanks to his stylish dunking. I would compare it with rock and roll and hip-hop. The reason why I say hip-hop is because, like, the freestyle of play that I play. And the rock and roll comes in, the energy that I build up before I dunk. Dixon also appears in an upcoming TV documentary about street ballers. And there's more. I'm involved in a slam dunk contest who's Vince Carter, NBA players involved with it. And just by Vince Carter being involved in the dunk contest, that's major notoriety right there. Dixon's even got his own clothing line through his company Ball for Life, which is aimed at mentoring kids. I just put myself in those kids' shoes and wish that I had somebody that could come to me when I was in the park on those rainy days and come and say, hey, man, you should do this, you should do that, and help me out. Knowing that I didn't have that, that's like my number one thing to give back to the kids. You know, while he's hoping all this extra exposure will help him land in the NBA, now that would be the ultimate slam dunk. They say the NBA is showtime and nothing but action. They missing me. <laughs> the main event. Naturally, that would take a few more lucky bounces. Whatever it is that I'm going to be doing, I know ball is going to be involved. In New Brunswick, Joey Waller, News 12, New Jersey Sports. Good to see he's doing well. That's it for tonight. It's home sweet. Our setting is the comfortable Rutgers locker room inside the rack in Piscataway. It includes the theater where the Scarlet Knights watch tape of their opponents. And Rutgers is hoping they can add to this trophy case this season. Hi, everybody. I'm Bruce Beck. Welcome to the Kevin Bannon Show. We'll be with you the next 16 weeks as we follow the Scarlet Knights from the opening tip to the final buzzer. We'll have highlights, features, and much more. We'll also follow the progress of the Big East Conference during the 1999-2000 season. Coach, good to be back with you again. Great to have you back, Bruce. The best thing we did in the offseason, re-sign Bruce Beck <laughs> back to the show. Great to have you back. Coach, you're also off to a pretty good start, 4-1. and one. you got to feel good about your club. feel real good. I mean, this is a really young team, and they are off to a great start. I think they've made significant progress just in the first couple weeks of the season. Flattery will get you nowhere. Let's take a look at the roster for the upcoming season. And Coach, you've got a nice blend of newcomers and veterans. Yeah, there's no question. We needed to address some things within the program. I think we're a bit bigger, definitely deeper, and I love our team speed. So even though our team is young, I certainly think that we've improved ourselves in just about every way. Eight of the 12 scholarship players are freshmen or sophomores. Yeah, and that's you know not something that we're going to use as an excuse. We, we're really excited. We want to keep this team together so that not only this year, but down the road, this is a team that can really peak and have a lot of success. Well, a lot has happened already this season. Let's begin our look back with the game between Rutgers and Ryder and an old friend and very familiar face for you, right, Coach? Absolutely. One of my best friends in the world, Don Harnum. We spent 10 years together, and uh, Don's a great guy, doing a great job with his Ryder team, and this was you know, kind of a unique opener to open the new Sovereign Bank Arena in Trenton. And you really did a lot of good things early on defensively, and you jumped out to a 9-0 lead. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a Ryder team that, that really struggled that night, but I think it was more of, of Rutgers because they haven't lost since. They've had some great wins. Our kids really came out of the box. And I thought, you know, got off to a great start, which is what you want to do on the road. You got to like the way that 
Dante Jones has gotten off to a start and Rashad Kent. Well, we need that. You know, we're not loaded with experience, so even sophomores like Jones and Kent need to perform at a high level. You know, we talked about some new faces. Lewis Flores is one of the new faces, and he's scoring some points for you. Yeah, we're really high on Lou. Lou's a guy that can play the one or the two, just has a nose for the basket. And, and that guy, Gene Dabney, we think is really going to be a terrific player. He's 6'10", he's a redshirt freshman. And, He's really got a lot of potential. Here's the Joel Salvi slam. Rutgers beating Riders 74 to 49. 18 steals in the ball game. Now we go back to November 22nd against Charleston Southern at the rack. Big game for Kent. 20 points. Well, that's the kind of game that we'd like to see Rashad dominate. You know, he's, he looks great. I mean, he's dropped weight, but he's so strong. Playing the four spot four is doing a terrific job. Todd Billett seems to be getting more comfortable. There's no question. I mean, uh, he, do, he doesn't look like a freshman out there. We have so much confidence in him, and he scores if he needs to, but he gets the ball distributed as well. I like the way that Dante Jones challenged there. Yeah, Dante's, he looks great. His body looks great, and I just think he's playing with great confidence. How about Mike Thompson, coach? Well, he's one of our newcomers that we're real high on. He can score around the basket, step out to threes. A 20 to 7 run in this ball game enabled the Scarlet Knights to jump out. They won this game 77 to 63 to go to 2 and 0. And then it was on to the Hoop and Quill Classic in St. Charles, Missouri. You lose the first game to Murray State. You win the next over Mississippi State. This is the game against Nebraska. Yeah, it was a good tournament for us. Excellent competition. We didn't get it done the first night with Murray State. I should say first morning, 9 a.m. start with Murray yeah, that's State. Early. But uh, we came back and had great wins over Mississippi and also over uh, over Nebraska. I mean, we really, I thought the team played at a very high level. Here's Kent on the fast break. And Greer had a marvelous game with 23 points. Yeah, Jeff Greer struggled in the first game, and then I had two very good games after that. Jeff was all over the place, finishing, hitting deep threes, the kind of things we want from our captain. You say anything to him in between the ball games? No, I just think, you know, Jeff's aware that if he doesn't play at a high level, particularly early in the year, we really, we're not going to be very good. And I think he knows that. He puts a lot of burden on his own shoulders. So. And he hit three for five from three-point land uh, in this game. You were up at the half, 39-31 and came away with a very solid victory over Nebraska. Well, I love the way we came out in the second half. I mean, we were only up eight at the half. We felt we, we played better than that. And it was great to see our come, guys come out with a nice run to start the second half. I like to see Kent there kicking the ball outside and looking for people. Well, I think that's one of the best things he does. Everybody knows he can score around the basket. What I think he's done a good job this year is make good decisions when to throw it out and when just to keep it and score around the basket. Here's a look at the first five ball games. And hey, that's not a bad way to look back at your first five. No, you know what's great. We've got four wins. We've only played one home game. And I think we've, we've played some pretty darn good competition as well. So I really like the, the start that these guys are off to. And speaking of starts, Dante Jones, 15 points per ball game. He also has 12 steals. Yeah, Dante's been terrific. Jeff Greer is the guy, again, team captain, outside, inside, done a terrific job uh, just being an all-around terrific player for us. Rashad Kent's numbers are up 13.6 points, 7.4 boards. Yeah, and this guy, Todd Billett, has been, I think, the glue. Uh, to have a point guard come in as a freshman and do the things that he's done. He made all tournament. His assist to turnover is, is over 2-1, to one, almost 3-1. to one. Uh, You couldn't ask for more from a young freshman guard. Rutgers has had a lot of success from three-point land. Anytime you're shooting better than 40% to start the season. And it doesn't just always happen that way. You've had some plays that are designed to free up players to make the three. And this is called Bannon's Breakdown as we dissect the play. And the coach has a chance to explain why it worked in this type of situation. Coach, lead us through. Well, this is a situation at the end of the half in the Ryder game. We had, a, I think, about 10 seconds left on the clock, and we tried to run a, a little quick hitter for Jeff Greer to either go to the basket or stop and hit a three. And uh, what I like about it is for the first game of the year, there was terrific execution. I mean, our guys, what we try to do is come down and, and get the ball to Jeff Greer with some space. And so we bring him on the baseline, and Joel Salvi does a good job of getting down there to free him up by setting up a baseline screen. As you can see, Jeff Greer really sells his man. His man thinks he's going the other way, and Jeff comes up and catches it around the top of the key, which is really his read, and he did a good job of reading it right here. Uh, the other thing we try to do now that we do have a score or get the basketball, we want to try to free him up a little bit and give him some space. And so we clear out, Dante Jones clears out the other side, and Alvitas Tinis comes up and sets a pick. And he set a, a, a terrific pick. I mean, he really got physical there. And, and then it's all about reading. And I think what Jeff did is he said, hey, you went behind the screen. I got an open shot. I'm going to take it. And he did a good job with it.
I'll tell you, it's nice to run the play, but it's better when the ball goes through the net and it did in that situation. Yeah, and, and you know, a coach can set up all the plays you want. The kids have to read it and they have to execute it. And right there, the guys did a fabulous job of just doing what came to them, what naturally was presented to them. So you like the execution? I like it, particularly for early in the year. <laughs> all right. Coming up next, we'll look ahead to the week ahead, including a game with the Hawks of St. Joe's. Stick around. With the coach in the video room, you spend a lot of time here? Absolutely. Uh, not just the coaches, but the players. I mean, this is our room. This is where we meet as a team, pregame, halftime, postgame, watch a lot of film. And it's kind of the nerve center of our scouting because we, we have uh, satellite hookups. We tape games from around the country. We edit those tapes, and we show those tapes. So it's really a, a room I spend half my life in during the season. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the upcoming schedule for the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. Two games this week against non-Big East Conference foes. First, it's the UMBC Retrievers this week. Well, this is a, a good matchup for us. They have a veteran team that won 19 or 20 games last year, and, and uh, they have seven kids from the metropolitan area, so they'll be pretty juiced up to play Rutgers. And then the St. Joe's Hawks at the Cathedral of Hoops, the Palestra. Great place to play, you know, bring a young team down there. Phil always does a great job with his team, so it's, it's kind of a nice non-conference rivalry to play. St. Joe's is 1-1 one one this year, a win over Western Kentucky, a loss to Tulsa. This is Timmy Brown, the senior guard, who's filling it up from three-point land. Yeah, I like their team. They're a perimeter-oriented team for the most part. They shoot the ball well, they're good off the dribble, they present a lot of matchup problems. And You know, last year it was kind of a reloading year for them. This year's team looks terrific. Name Crenshaw, the only player to start every game a year ago. Yeah. Marvin O'Connor is a guy, a transfer from Villanova. Well, we, we remember Marvin well. He's a guy that real, really can give you a lot of excitement and scores in the open court. Tough kid. And Marvin also a guy who was the Philadelphia Inquirer Player of the Year at fabled Simon Gratz. Yeah, he's, he's a big name in the Philly area, and it's a good grab for St. Joe's because I, I think he's, like I say, he's kind of an energetic guy that the other kids really read off of. Here's Bill Phillips, a transfer from William & Mary. Great grab by Phil and his staff because he's a guy that was playing, uh, you know, at that level, and he really belonged at, at the Atlantic 10 level, and he's come in and really done a nice job for them around the basket. Nine and a half points, seven and a half boards this year. Damian Reed, a guy that you know a lot about, right? Yeah, we, we recruited Damian, and he ended up at St. Joe's and, and had, has had a good career, and he looks like he's really ready to explode. He's an athletic guy, scores around the basket, another high-energy guy. I really like their team. And he looks like David Robinson. They call him the Little Admiral. <laughs> he does look like David Robinson. Just better not play like David Robinson next week. All right, let's talk about your keys for these two games coming up, starting with UMBC. Well, again, UMBC has a great little scorer named Terrence Ward. Very good three-point shooter, really carries their team. Got to do a good job on him in the perimeter. Uh, probably the second thing is is our defense. You're playing at home, and uh, we've really got to try to take a team that runs their sets very, very well, take them out of their sets. And the last thing would be for us to continue our progress executing. Uh, they, they play good, aggressive defense. Just execute our game plan and, and hopefully get a home win. All right, what's the focus for the Hawks? The Hawks is definitely good perimeter defense. They, they're really good off the dribble, shoot the ball with range. So that's where it all starts going on the road. Uh, definitely Mar limiting Marvin O'Connor's production. He's a guy that can score in the half court, can score off steals, transition. Got to find him. And, and lastly, I'd say it's keeping them off the offensive glass, as we saw on the tape. They're relentless. You know, they do a very good job of keeping the ball alive, Damian Reed and, and, and that crew. So we've got to do a good job of limiting them to one or no shots. Kevin's Keys brought to you by And One Apparel. You've got to keep a close eye on what the Hawks do this weekend up in Syracuse at the Carrier Classic. Yeah, this will be a good test for them. They've only played two games. So, you know, as they get a couple, a little bit of momentum in that game, they're coming home. It's, it's, it's going to be an important non-league game for us. All right, coming up next. Things will get energized as Joel Salvi stops by. Stick around. Show. It's a pleasure right now to welcome Joel Salvi, a senior from Maryland who comes off the bench and does a superb job adding energy and excitement to the Scarlet Knights. Great to have you, Joel. Thanks to be here. It's my first time, so I don't know what I'm expecting from you two, but <laughs> hopefully it'll go pretty smooth. Hey, I talk about energy, and I talk about passion. The way you come out there and play, you get the crowd really razzed up. Is that part of your role? 
Well, definitely. That's a role that I've uh, taken in this program. Uh, I think I've done a pretty good job with it. And um, I've just played like that pretty much, you know, as long as I've been playing basketball. Come out and I, I try to, you know, do, have, do a lot of things that help the team, and it works. Sports information guru here at Rutgers, John Beiser, calls you a, a Rutgers guy who's a retro player, you know, a kickback with the high hair and the high socks. I mean, do you feel like you're still in the 60s or what? No, no, I don't feel like I'm in the 60s. I just, you know, when, I, when I've played, I've always uh, pulled my socks up. It's kind of like a Maryland thing. I see a lot of guys with that, and that's just pretty much how I play. The hair just comes naturally. I think one of the things about Joel is that, you know, he may not like this, but, you know, Forget the socks and forget the hair and everything else. <laughs> Anytime you have a player that knows and accepts his role and does a wonderful job with it, as a coach, you're pretty happy. And this is a guy that from the day he's arrived at Rutgers, he rebounds, he defends, he dives on the floor, he has good practices. He's just a spirited guy who really rubs off on his teammates. Does it bother you to come off the bench? Oh, not at all. This is, that, like I said before, it's a role that I've taken and I've done pretty well at. And I don't have a problem. As long as I'm playing and contributing to a team, then I feel good about it. And you're really known as a tenacious rebounder. You feel you can contribute in that way? Well, I kind of, I kind of, uh, kind of uh, strive to be like the famous rebounder Robin, where he, he, he knows kind of like the trajectory of the ball when it's shot, and you can see where it's coming off. And I try to get a body, and the uh, coaching staff does a good job of seeing, seeing that, and uh, I do pretty good. Here's Joel's numbers so far, Kevin, and you know I think he contributes in more ways than you can really look at when you're talking about a graphic. Yeah, I think the numbers don't mean very much whenever you're talking about Joel Salvi. And the minutes in particular, we've been in some lopsided games. His minutes will be much more when we get into the, the beef of our schedule because we do have a young team, and Joel's one of our few, well, only two seniors that we have, so Joel's a guy that's going to be on the floor for a lot of minutes. Leadership, it's part of your role, isn't it? Definitely. Um, when I, when, uh, I saw you know, Rob Hodgson and Jeff Billett left, and those were our seniors. Now, me and Alvitas, we, we're stepping up, being a little more vocal in practice, and we just got to get out there and do things that it takes to win. Thanks for stopping by and keep up the energy and the enthusiasm we need right. in this show. You know Thanks what I mean? Thanks a lot. Get a haircut. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> well, you see this guy oftentimes slamming balls through the hoop. Uh, that leads us to nicely the Monster Slam of the Week, which is brought to you by Monsterslam.com. Unfortunately, Coach, it's Rashad Kent. Well, Salvi had a few. We'll just look at Kent. That was a great play on Rashad's part. Good penetration, and he just got in there and showed his athleticism and his power on one dunk. Brought to you by Monsterslam.com, your online store for Rutgers merchandise. I'll tell you, this guy goes to the hoop with a vengeance. He's got some power too, doesn't he? Yeah, he really does. I mean, he's he's dropped weight, but he's stronger. There's no no question that he's stronger than last year and, and faster than last year. We're pretty excited about Rashad right now. All right, coming up next, we'll go around the Big East Conference. We'll also have the Scarlet Spotlight. Don't go away. Week one of the Kevin Bannon Show, and right now it's time for the Scarlet Spotlight. During the course of the season, we're going to find out more about the individuals and Kevin's team than just what happens on the floor. We're going to find out about some things off the court as well. And this week, the Scarlet Spotlight, brought to you by the Rutgers Court Club, features Rashad Kent. Sets up Kent. Kent, and the bucket counts. Hello, I'm Rashad Kent, 6'5 forward, sophomore. Nice move inside. That's outstanding. Rashad Kent. I would like to be a part of a program that was um, in, in search for a resurgence, and I found that in Rutgers. Plus, um, it's a very great academic school, and the pe once I came on my visit, the people treated me with um, great respect, and I really appreciated that. Well, uh, my expectations consist of hopefully having a, a 21 season, making it to the NCAA tournament, because I'm um, I feel that we've all worked so so hard in the off season that I, I, I feel that it's really going to pay off throughout the season. I call my mother every once in a while because that's really my inspiration and my motivation to play. So I love talking to her when I can talk to her. Probably my favorite individual person is um what happened to be Jay Z. You know the wrist brought bed minus two degrees. About as blue as the sea, the way I'm new with a V. Hat cop can't see his eyes. Just like every album be? he's come out with, he's given it his all. And then um, people really appreciate what, what he does for the music industry. Maybe chicken. Um, because um, I was raised on it. It's full of protein and it's definitely good for my body. So. 
I think he's eating a lot of chicken because he's off to a very good start. Yeah, I mean, Rashad's done all the right things. You want to see the maturity level take a giant leap from their freshman and sophomore years. Kid's done it. Done a great job. Um, it's just worked on his body, worked on his skills. He's playing the four instead of the five for us, and that just gives us so many new dimensions for our team. And um, it all started with Rashad's off season, which was fantastic. Last year was a terrific year for the Big East Conference, capped of course by UConn winning the national championship once again this year. They are the favorite in the league, and around the Big East is brought to you by New Jersey Transit. Pressure from Jones, Langdon trips, and UConn has done it! UConn has won the national championship in its first attempt. We hopefully be more physical, better rebounding team, maybe exert a little more pressure, and quite frankly, even though we've been deep, play a little deeper so we can try to wear you out. I don't think our five is anywhere near as good as last year's, but our ten may be better. What we're trying to do is make sure we stay focused and do the things that have gotten us to this point and not allow ourselves to be affected by people's high expectations or just like we didn't allow ourselves to be affected negatively by the low expectations that people had years ago of our program. I think a lot of people don't think we're going to do that well, but I think we're going to surprise a lot of people. We have uh, good outside shooters in Martin Inglesby and Matt Carroll, and I think we have guys that can play inside, and you really can't double-team our inside guys because our shooters uh, will hurt you from the outside. The only real expectation is that we get better from last season. Uh, I think we played pretty competitive <clears throat> towards the end of the season. We had kind of established a style of play, and, and, I, and that's the thing that we want to continue to build on. I think we're going to be better than we were last year just because of the fact that we have our starters back. But we had a good recruiting year, and I'm confident that we're going to have a better team than we had last year. I think we have a good core group. We don't have a lot of depth, so we're going to have to play real smart basketball and obviously play with a great passion and a great enthusiasm and really defend and, and do a good job of, of rebounding. I have to be patient as a basketball coach more than ever this year. When you have such a turnover, you have to have an understanding that it's going to take your players a longer period of time to understand what it takes to win in this league. These guys this year, um, they really want to go out and show the Big East that um, they, they know how to play. And, um, they can play in the Big East. And last year, we were just a little, a little rough on the edges. And this year, got some experience from the guys that was there last year. We expect to make the tournament. I mean, that's what we're always, that's our goal always. And uh, we've won 20 games five of the last six years. So uh, it's something that, that we've grown to expect, and we expect the same thing again. There's a renewed enthusiasm and excitement around our program. I think because of what these kids have done this past two years, and now we're looking forward to see if we can make some steps. And we have an influx of new players, and I think, especially with the young kids, if they can grow up in a hurry, I think gives us an opportunity to have a possibly a very successful year. We're going to play whatever style we have to play. I mean, what it means is some nights we run and we press like crazy. Other nights we might throw a thousand passes, who knows. But uh, this team's going to have to be ready to do a lot of different things, both offensively and defensively. We could be a good, good basketball team, but we got to be more consistent. Hopefully having three seniors instead of three juniors, two juniors instead of the two sophomores that started, and two sophomores now instead of two freshmen that came in off the bench. We will be a more consistent team, and, and we could be a, a great basketball team. So what are the expectations for the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers coming off a 19-win season in NIT season? Well, I think it's progress, progress, progress. You know, have a good practice today. Let's have a good week this week, good month this month, good preseason going into the Big East. I mean, this is a young group that's really got a lot of talent. So, you know, we don't want these kids to focus on the wrong things. Just get better individually. We'll definitely get better collectively. And uh, this is an exciting bunch that I think can go pretty far. Some final thoughts coming up as we go to break. A look at the standings brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts.
Todd Billett, Big East Rookie of the Week, he averaged 15.7 points per game, Coach. He's really been an impact player for us, and the great thing is it's, it's only going to get better. And he's also shooting very well from three-point land, so are the Scarlet Knights in general. Don't forget Tucker Anthony, the official investment firm of the Big East, will donate $150 to the Rutgers General Scholarship Fund for each three made this year, thus far this season. 32, 11 by Billet, 11 by Greer, 10 by Jones. And for more information on Rutgers Athletics, check them out on the World Wide Web. Coach, two games this week. You looking forward to it? Very much so. We've only had one home game, so we get another home game this week and a tough one on the road at St. Joe's, but hopefully we can keep this thing rolling along. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Bruce. That's it for the Kevin Bannon Show. See you next week, everybody. Well, Philly was the place for Rutgers tonight. Going into the Palestra to face St. Joe's, it's not a stretch to say this would not be easy. Loosen up, Dante Jones. Loosen up and let the triples fly. That's string music right there. The coach applauding Rutgers' first lead of the night midway through the first half. They were up five at the break. Great little pass to Joel Showtime Salvi. That's how you do it. Down the stretch we go, and it's tight. Who's going to be a hero? Todd Billett, that's who. The freshman buries the three. When Rutgers needed the buckets tonight, they got him. Game came down to this. Final second. St. Joe's needs a triple for overtime. They will not get it. And that's your ball game. Rutgers hangs on 73-70. That's a good win in Philly for the Scarlet Knights tonight. Alstra taking on Rutgers. Early on, St. Joe's looking good. South Jersey's Rob Haskins right there getting the job done. But the guy for Rutgers tonight, Joel Salvi. He was a real factor inside. Oh, strong move to the hoop right there. And Salvi had a lot of those. This game was a seesaw affair. But Salvi and Rutgers, they go on to win it by three. St. Joe's women earlier at the Palestra, big win over Penn. Eagles head. Rutgers Scarlet Knights taking on the Hawks from St. Joe's. Knights up one late second half. Dante Jones out to Joel Salvi, who drives and pops in two of his 14. Rutgers goes up by three and wins it by three, 73 to seven. Russ, a few scores. In the jam, Phil Martelli's boys down by one, but Joel Salvi hits the J for Rutgers, and they went on to beat the Hawks 73 to 70 tonight. But that's a fun team, the Hawks. Go check them out. All right, thank you, Beasley.